Hi there, I'm Matt Holland and you're watching Irish Football Fan TV. Hello and welcome to Irish Football Fan TV. Today I'm at the K Club in Kildare, delighted to be joined by none other than Republic of Ireland legend Kevin Sheedy. Kevin, firstly, thank you very much for your time. My pleasure, Paul. Um, just, you, you, it's a lot of memories and you know, you played in arguably our best ever team. So I just wanted to kind of go through, you know, your career as a whole. You're obviously here on a, you know, a memorable weekend with the, the Irish team and stuff like that from that from that area. So I just wanted to talk to you kind of, well, firstly, kind of about how you came about playing for Ireland. You know, I know you played underage level and stuff like that and then kind of through your Irish career. So uh, if you wouldn't mind just uh, talking us through kind of how you, I know you were qualified through your father, was it? Yeah. I was 16, I was playing for Hereford United, my local team. Um, I was on the fringe of getting in the first team, uh, and I got selected to play for the the Irish uh, youth team. So it was it was great for me to sort of um, as a young lad, you know, travelling over to Ireland and you know um, playing with good players, you know, gaining experience against um, international teams. And that certainly, uh, when I look back at my career, that certainly helped it. And then obviously going on to make my uh, my Irish debut, um, you know, it was brilliant as a young player growing up, and you know. You, you strive to, to, to play at the highest level that you can. And I remember my, my debut against Malta. Uh, I remember playing at Dalyman Park against uh, Van Basten, Hullet and Wright Carter's young players that were playing for, for Holland. It was quite ironic in 88, you know, the same, played against the same players. Uh, we played Italy again at Dalyman Park. It was like a full house and more. Uh, there was people climbing over the wall with ladders and it was just like uh, when you were taking a corner you had to pass. There's actually because... a very iconic picture of yourself and Liam Brady standing over a free kick against Italy in Daily Mount. Yeah. I must send that over to you though. Yeah I've, I've seen, and it's, it's, it's people on the roof and all that I mean today's health and safety you wouldn't get away with this so I, I, I wouldn't guess what the crowd was like but it, it knows you know you look back and there's still really fond memories of you know um dealing with all that you know dealing with big crowds playing against the best players in the world as a young player uh, so as i say I look back on my career and it was certainly um helped me throughout my my playing career um domestically and internationally as well yeah how did your call up originally uh, come about uh, as, as a young for your player first, for your first cap for first cap, um, a long, such a long time ago, you just um, just remember getting the, the the usual standard letter to say you'd be included in the squad. Uh, so you just travel. No phone over. calls back in those days, no. Not not really, no. Just um, you just you know you you were selected, um, and then travel over and then to be to be named to start. You know your first international cap is is the stuff the dreams are made of. So you know I look back with the real fond memories, and you know the start of I eventually ended up getting forty seven caps. Um, you know, so that's the first one, and you know, so it was great to get that first one under your belt. Yeah, and obviously you got you got called up as your own hand. Who called you? Yeah, yeah. So How does he kind of differ from Jack Charlton? Um, different styles. Opinion. Different styles. I mean, it was Jack's way of the highway. Uh, I think a bit more more with Owen. Uh, he was influenced, sort of say, by the the senior players at times, uh, which you know. Uh, looking back, you know that probably you know he, he could have been a bit firmer, I think. But certainly when uh, when Jack took over, then it was Jack's way or the highway. So totally totally different uh, man management skills there. Having said that, Jack was still a great man manager, you know, but in a different way where you knew, you know, you had to do it the way he wanted to do, or you'd bring someone else in who would. Yeah. So kind of talk us through how yeah how he's got to Euro '88 and you know how the tournament went for yourselves. Uh, obviously, I think it was the first. Involvement in a major tournament, uh, Ireland had. What well, was there a lot of pressure when he's going into that, like uh, as like the first country, to, uh, first team to be representing our country in a, in a tournament. Yeah, I mean it, it was great to, to qualify. Uh, some tough teams to get there. So when you when we actually qualified, you know it's it's something that you you know you you've got really to look forward to. Um, but it was a different format in those games. It was like two groups of four, a semi final and a final. Um, we got off to a great start. Uh, obviously, Ray Houghton scoring against England, beating them one 0 There was a lot of pressure building up to the first game for the players and for Jack. He obviously won the World Cup with with England, and uh, you know we we could tell the pressure was getting to him a little bit. Uh, but certainly, you know, players went out performed. Um, it was like a local derby. You know, yeah, everybody. It wasn't a bad start, was it? It wasn't. It was perfect, and uh, you know, to get off to get off to a winning start uh, in the competition, you know, put takes a little bit of the pressure off into the second game. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the stadium was full, you know, it was a, a different sort of atmosphere to what you used to playing in domestic football, you know, in league. It's like you're playing country against country and it's just uh, a real special atmosphere. 
Yeah, we even went on then to play Russia, and then obviously you speak about the game of Holland, and we're six minutes away from getting through to the next round. Um, what what was running through our minds in the in the Holland game? I suppose the the Russia game had came and gone. Well, just going back to the Russia game, I mean, obviously they were one of the top teams. It was pretty, you know, it was Russia in those days. It wasn't all the, the splits, uh, split countries. Yeah, and, hard, wasn't it? yeah, and uh, they had some great players, and we we should have beaten them. We we were definitely the better team. Um, so obviously, just getting a draw against them, going in against Holland, a draw would have got us through to the the, the semi final. Um, and we, we 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 more than held them, and then it was a, a freakish goal, uh, six minutes from time. And then when you look to to see that you know the, the finalists Holland against Russia, who we you know were more than a match for, um, then certainly you think when you're looking back, I think that gave us the the belief that we could compete against anybody in the world. Um, and then obviously moving on to the the World Cup uh, qualifying games, you know it's Spain, real great team, uh, beat them one 0 at home. Um, so we, you know we we were. We were we were snowballing in confidence, you know. We, everyone knew what they was required for them. Uh, you, you loved coming over for the games, um, and certainly, you know, we were more than a match for for any team. The style of football, obviously, is well known that it was more of a longer ball, and we were putting pressure on teams that weren't used to having pressure put on them. That's in, where the song comes from. In the, in their own half, sort of thing. So, whereas usually you lost possession, the, the opposition retreated, and then they tried to break you down. But certainly, uh, it was a high tempo game. Um, played with one striker and uh, the pressure they had to put on the defenders they couldn't last 90 minutes so it was always a rotation where there was John Aldridge, Frank Stapleton, uh, Tony Cascarino, Niall Quinn you know they sort of all you know knew what they had to do um, and then it was like you know good players I was talking to Steve Stoughton last night and Chris Hewton and like people saying about you know the full backs putting long balls in but when you've got the quality of those two players Steve Stoughton magical left foot uh, Dennis Irwin, Chris Hewton, great right foot. So they're putting balls into areas where it's difficult for defenders. Um, so I think it's, some people over, overlook the fact of that. And then you had the the, the workman like team that we we all were in it together, and um, you know we, we had huge success. Yeah, some serious players, and I was thinking of that. And you had Ronnie Wheel and Paul McGrath to add to that list as well. Like a serious team. Um, he's obviously built on the Euro '88 going into the World Cup. Um, Obviously, very, very memorable, memorable World Cup for yourself, bagging our first ever World Cup goal, and then obviously it was against the old enemy as well to, to earn a draw. What were your thoughts in that game? Again, it was uh, a, a, you know the draw again couldn't have been you know again for Jack. Um, you know the, the pressure was on him. We went to a, a training camp in Malta uh, for two weeks to to acclimatise for the weather, and I think most of the time it rained over there. It was just that type of thing. But it it was still great for the bonding for the players because we, we had such a good rapport with each other that sometimes you know you're away for a long time, away from home, you know, two weeks. Uh, but we had such great characters, you know, had, had so many great laughs, you know, and you, the time goes quickly, train properly, um, and then you, you, it's getting closer to the, the, you know, your first ever game in the World Cup. Again, going back to my boyhood, you know, you grow up watching the likes of Brazil, uh, 1970 World Cup, you know, and just all the World Cups, Maradona, uh, 86. So to actually get there, be selected on the team sheet to, to play, then it's, it's, it's what your dreams are made of. Um, I remember the night it was a uh, typical British weather it was windy raining um, again it was it wasn't a great football match but it was a derby game uh, we knew them they knew all about us um, and just um, Gary Inska scored he bundled a, a ball uh, the ball over the line from about four yards with his chest um, and then you know the, we sort of you know rolled our sleeves up so to speak and we started to get them a bit more uh, I vividly remember the goal a long kick from Packy Bonner uh, Tony Cascarino's challenge for it. Uh, it's broke to me. Uh, I've tried to slide Tony Cascarino back in, but it was intercepted by Steve McMahon, who just come on as sub, and I don't think he was up to the pace of the game. He just come on, and he played a square pass to, to Gary Stevens, which I intercepted, and then as soon as it left my boot, I knew it was in because years and years of training, uh, finishing practices, you know when you hit it sweet, you know it's arrow in, in the bottom corner, and it was a great feeling to see. Um, to see it hit the back of the net so you know personally uh, as you mentioned it was a piece of history no one would be able to take away from me Ireland's first ever goal in the World Cup um, and you know it, 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 it the game petered out a bit after that we had a couple of half chances they had a couple of half chances uh, but I think both teams in the end you know uh, it kept us in the competition 
Um, you know, but looking back at the goal again, uh, I always have a laugh with Alan McCoughlin. Um, after my shot, he, like a good attacking midfield player, he's gone in for, the, for any rebound and he was about five yards offside. Uh, I think in the modern game, he, he'd probably been given offside, but he wasn't for interfering. interfering. He wasn't interfering sort of thing, you know, so I say he could have cost me about 2,000 pints of Guinness sort of thing. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, no, fantastic memories. And, you know, uh, it's a moment I'll always, you know, I'll always treasure. Yeah, were you aware of like, the celebrations back home? I actually wasn't even born at this point, but were you aware of the celebrations back home? Not after the first game. It was only when we, we moved on to the <coughs> the second game um, that we start, the, the journalist started showing us footage of you know what was happening back in, in Ireland and you know Ireland was coming to a standstill with the games and all that sort of thing. So I think then you know we could see it for ourselves sort of thing like so we knew exactly what you know what, what a great time uh, the supporters were having both over in Italy and both back at home. So, uh, but ever um, talking about that goal, I was uh, I was at the races about two years ago, and I was uh, with a couple of friends and my wife, and I was we were in a bar. Anyway, uh, there was a couple in the corner, and he called me over, and uh, he said, "Kevin Sheedy." I said, "Yeah." He said, uh, "This is my wife. We're celebrating 25 years of marriage." Uh, he said they lived in the same village, um, but they didn't go to the same places. And the night of the Ireland England game. Uh, when I scored, they were the closest to each other, and they just hugged each other, started going out, and they're celebrating 25 years. So you know, you, you hear lots of different type of stories about that. That uh, what people were doing with that goal. Yeah, well, it must make you. It must make you feel, you know, over the moon when you hear stuff like that. Yeah. I, I hope they. I hope they brought you for a few drinks when they met you. Oh, yeah, we had a few drinks after. Yeah, late into the night, so it was good. But you know, you just you, you just don't know. So it's just it's just just great. You know, we had, we had, a, we had a good laugh sort of thing. Yeah, that's absolutely magical. Um, but then we, we were going in, I suppose, the, 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 big, the next biggest thing then in terms of that tournament was the Romania game. And you, you know, we scored the first penalty. Did you just practice penalties? You know, we're not really known for I know we, it was 2002 with, with Spain and then there was um, yeah. the Romania game. They're the only two that, that spring to my mind off the top of my head. But um, did you just practice them in, 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 in the camp? Was it something that, you know, you were preparing for? Um, we we did we did practice them. I mean, I, I was Everton's penalty taker, so I was always practicing them, and I was always practicing them uh, with Ireland. So, um, and I was the the, the penalty taker. So, um, you don't think about it. You, you don't plan for penalties. You, you're planning for the ninety minutes. Then it's going to extra time, and you're trying to win it extra time. It's probably only the last couple of minutes of the game that you think this is go, going to penalties here. Um, so, as soon as the final whistle went, um, my mindset was, I'll take the first one. Um, there's no point leaving it till the end and you know some of the other players may miss and I don't get the chance to take one so I just said I'll take the first penalty um, but it's, it's funny because um, not you know people you'd think would want to take penalties don't always want to do it in that pressure situation I think you've seen with England over the years when they had the penalty shootouts they've missed you know you've, you've got players in situations like Gareth Southgate like um, David Batty who weren't sort of goal scorers didn't want to take one but nobody else uh, offered step up, so yeah. um, Andy Townsend said he'd take one uh, Ray Houghton said he'd take one and then it was a bit of debate and all that and then Tony Cascarino said he'd take one reluctantly sort of thing and then uh, again waiting looking for and then Dave O'Leary said he'll, he'll take one so um, the order it went I said I go first uh, I think it was Tony then it was Ray then it was Cass and then David um, Hadji took uh, Romania's first first penalty and it is a long walk from the halfway line uh, to, to, to to take the penalty and I, I hear people saying you know you can replicate it on the training ground and all stuff like that you can't replicate a penalty shootout in a match is enormous that. Well, it's, yeah. it's like it's you've got 20,000 Irish supporters behind the goal uh, you can't miss sort of thing so I, I'd made my mind up um, the goalkeeper in my thinking was had to dive he couldn't just stand there for the first penalty, so I was just going to hit it as hard as I can down the middle and high, uh, so that if he did dive and have a trailing leg, the ball would be high enough to go over it. So fortunately, I, I held my nerve. Uh, Very psychological. You wouldn't think that much. Like for me, looking uh, from the outside in, I wouldn't have thought that much into it. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you, you've got to be, you've got to be focused. And at the end of the day, if the keeper say, it makes a save and you've hit it as well as you can, then then you, you hold down it. But if you sometimes players ch change their mind at the last minute and they don't really see the 
the shot through sort of thing. But as I say, I'd, I'd pick my spot and I hit it as hard as I could. And, you know, it was a great feeling to uh, wrestle, uh, wrestle in the back of the net and the, the Irish supporters going mad behind the goal. So it was like, um, and then you've done your job sort of thing. So you're feeling then for the other lads, you know, you, you want them to sort of like, um, fortunately, um, Andy took a great penalty. Ray took a great penalty, and then you could see Tony Cascarino. We we laughed about it for years afterwards. He didn't want it, and he was white, you know. And he he, he walked to the. He didn't look a man. Did you tell him or give him a voice of where to put the ball? Not to, not Tony. The, the the last one with David. It oh, did. Sorry, yeah. It's um. So Cast uh, took his penalty, and he'd taken the biggest divot, and the goalkeeper's gone down early, and because he did it so slowly, it sort of trickled into the corner, sort of thing. Like so, that's we had a huge piece of luck there. Um, and then obviously Packy making that brilliant save. Yeah, it's um, iconic. Yeah, I mean he he, he was getting close. He was getting close to them. They weren't, you know, and he, um, and it was it was it was a good height for Packy, but you still got to go the right way, and you still got to be there to save it. So that that was, uh, as you say, a piece of piece of history. And then David uh, was stepping up, and I just I just said to him, Dave, just pick your pick your spot, don't change your mind, and and see it through, sort of thing, and. Uh, uh, he held his nerve. It was a, a, a great penalty sort of thing. You would uh, the odds you'd have got on Dave O'Leary scoring the fifth penalty in the in the shootout sort of thing. You'd have got great odds, I think. But no. Um, so again, Dave will always be remembered for for that one moment. And it was just like uh, you you feel felt you, it's a it's a hard way to go out of a World Cup. So you did feel a little bit of sympathy towards the Romanians. But at the end of the day, we were through. So you just you like, did your job. Yes, indeed. Uh, and we were all obviously celebrating. You know. In the dressing room and that. So, and then once you you've settled down, whatever, then your thoughts then are moving on to the the next game. We already knew um, we had Italy in the the next round. It was going to be in Rome. Um, so you know that was a that was a tough tough you know draw for us sort of thing. Um, so yeah, so um, obviously preparing for for that game. Yeah, so you're going into the Italy game. You know, obviously they're hosting the World Cup and obviously a very good team. Um, what were your thoughts going into it? I know you, you end up getting marked, a man marked by uh, Bergatomi, was it? Bergomi. Bergomi, sorry. Yeah. Um, Giuseppe Bergomi, yeah. yeah. Um, did you think that was, uh, I, I know we lost the game, did you feel that that was almost a compliment that they had you man marked out of the game? I think so, because it hadn't really happened to me before, because I sort of, um, with the full backs, I'd sort of go into positions where I'd see if they'd come and mark me, and they, if they would do. Um, Certainly with Everton, you know, we had um, strikers to, to move into the space at the fullback to get, come too tight to me. But um, they had Beresi, um, who was the best centre back in the world at that time. Uh, so certainly it, it was, a, it was a, my toughest opponent, sort of thing. But I think, again, um, it was a tight game. We, we run them close. I remember um, Beresi intercepted my pass to John Aldrich, um, toe poked the ball through his leg. Went to Donadoni, he'd run half the length of the pitch, shot uh, Packy's parried it, and uh, it could have gone anywhere, but unfortunately for us, it went to um, uh, Scalacci, who, uh, who was obviously on fire in that tournament. He was scoring all the goals, uh, and he scored. Uh, so we went in 1 0 half time, but still a very close game. Uh, second half came out, same thing, not many chances at either end, and we just uh, I just felt on the, on the night as well that you're not, you're not blaming the referee, but the referee was very uh, towards Italy. Every 50-50 decision, he gave that towards Italy sort of thing. So over a, a period of time and uh, in a tight game, it just tipped the scales, I, I think, uh, slightly towards Italy. So um, um, I remember Jack saying after the game, you, you won't know how close you've come to, to winning the World Cup um, because after that, it was West... Uh, Argentina, we'd have played in the semi-final, and even though they still had Maradona, they were an aging team, and they weren't the team that they were in in '86. Um, but you know, we gave it our best shot, sort of thing. Some some fantastic memories along the way. So looking at that team that you had, did, did you just fear anyone? No, not at all, because you just you know all our players were playing for the top team in the Premiership. Uh, so you had players playing for Liverpool, uh, Tottenham, uh, Everton. Uh, so we, we were all competing at that time as well in Europe. So you're playing European football. So we we had the players who had the the nous and the experience of you know playing domestically in Europe and also uh, for for Ireland. So no, we certainly we didn't fear anybody. Yeah, because again the, the names coming into the team. When you look at kind of compare it to the team we have now, we, we 
we've only got a you know a handful of players playing in the Premier League in comparison. It's just such a it's such a it's such a jump. But how did your international career kind of come to an end then? Um, I was sort of coming towards I, I sort of after Italy ninety um, the season after. Um, I wasn't featuring as much as I wanted to. I was still in the squad, sub, playing sometimes. But uh, I was always, I always wanted to play. I did. I wasn't being on the bench, bench as a sub, or just having bit parts of games. That wasn't for me. So I had a chat with uh, Howard Kendall, and just we just felt it was probably the right time for for me to move. So uh, I moved a good move to Newcastle. Kevin Keegan just taken over. So it sort of kept my. Um, international career goal and we just failed to qualify for the uh, 92, 92 Euros uh, last game we needed to beat Turkey I think we beat them 4 or 5 nil, and then uh, England beats Poland 1 nil with about 6 or 7 minutes to go Gary Lineker scored uh, if they'd have had got a draw we'd, we'd have qualified for the for the 92 so you know we, we were close again to, to qualifying and then moving on to the um, the qualification for the USA. Um, I was still involved in the squad, and then I left Newcastle. Uh, I was 34, 33, 34. I moved to Blackpool. Um, so I, I, the next couple of squads I wasn't selected for, and then the the last game was against Northern Ireland, where we needed to win. There was a couple of injuries in midfield, and Jack Charlton called me to say, you know, he. he, he that it hadn't been in the last couple of squads. I understood the situation, but he said we need. You know, at the time, I had a blinking um, calf injury, and I, I I was desperate to, to go, but it's just one of those I, I wasn't fit, uh, so I missed out on that. But fortunately, um, Alan scored and we won one nil to qualify. So I just missed out on um, on the USA. So, uh, but desperately disappointed with that. But um, your career comes to an end, so that was my the end of my uh, international career. But still, uh, you kind of you bowed out at a at a good level rather than kind of carrying on too long. Where people, you know, you get to a point sometimes where fans want people out. Even it happened to Robbie Keane, and he he was you know, best ever goal scorer. Like, it just kind of comes to a point like that. But um, just in terms of the 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 current setup, what what are your thoughts? Do you think you know we can qualify for any tournaments or upcoming tournaments coming up? I think it's a bit of a transition maybe in in the team at the moment. There's been a couple of. The result against Wales wasn't great, but obviously the performance was better um, against Poland. Yeah. Um, so I think it's uh, it's. I'm not quite sure the strength and depth we've got of the younger players coming through, um, but obviously they certainly need to be playing at a high high level. As I mentioned before, when we were really successful, all most of the squad uh, were playing for the top teams. So you know, the more players that we can have playing in the Premiership, then obviously it'll help the uh, the international team immensely. Yeah, and and obviously with yourself, I know you were obviously born in Wales and grew up in Wales, played for Ireland. Um, looking at the Declan Royce situation, he's played three go- three games for Ireland. And he played under underage football all the way up. Um, what are your thoughts on kind of his situation at the moment? Well, it's, it's a personal decision. Um, obviously, I'm not in full knowledge of all the facts as to, as to why he's you know he, he's debating which which to do. Um, so again, I can't really guide him or say, well, he should do this, he should do that, because and ultimately it's his career. Uh, he's got to make the right decision that he's happy with. Um, so hopefully that um, you know it gets sorted sooner rather than later, and he can he can fully concentrate on on, on playing his football. Yeah, because ideally you talk about Premier League players. He's one there, obviously. Um, you're an Everton man. Um, you know we seen him last week against Everton. You know he bossed the midfield. And control the game. Um, don't see many of our other players basically doing that uh, for Ireland at, at any level at the moment. Sure. Uh, other than maybe Harry Arthur is doing okay for Cardiff. Yeah. Um, and obviously Seamus is out injured at the moment, but he, he always does a good job. But uh, just like when you, that's I think that's the thing that's most frustrating for you know most Irish fans is the fact that he's doing really well now at, at club level. Yeah. And you know. When he wasn't really doing well at club level, we still wanted him. Mm. England kind of just came in late, so I think that's I think that's the thing that most people are getting wound up about. Sure, yeah, yeah. So I, I think you know, um, as I say, he's got to make the right decision. Hopefully, he he decides to play play for Ireland because obviously we need as many good players 
as what we can have and he's, or he's could even build a team around that's him, it know? indeed yeah. so as, as I said before it's, it's in transition and certainly when you've got a player of his talent we certainly need him playing for Ireland yeah 100% I have just a, one fine question uh, he's asked there for uh, Luke Jordan is his name and he said having been a coach at Everton who do you think Irish or why do you think Irish players don't come through at Premier League clubs anymore? Is it simply because of the clubs having worldwide scouting networks, or are we simply not good enough? Um, it's it's difficult. I mean, if I'm speaking from when I was at Everton, um, we certainly did have a, a strong Irish contingent. You know, of the with Seamus, obviously uh, Shane Duffy, um, James McCarthy, um, Darren Gibson. So there's always been a strong Irish um, connection. And certainly at a, the younger level, we've got scouts over over in Ireland, and if they're good enough, um, we certainly you know try and get them. Um, looking at the other clubs, the likes of Chelsea, Man City, um, they they're scouting from all over the world, and they're buying in the best players from all over the world. So um, financially, yes, young players might get get more money going to those types of clubs, but ultimately. Um, it's their careers, you know. If they're good enough, the money comes to them in this current the current game now. Um, but sometimes you can get snarled up in in a system at, at clubs like uh, Chelsea, like Man City, where it's really difficult. And they they're buying the best players in the world every season. They're having a new manager every one or two seasons. So they're coming in with a big checkbook and they're just going out and buying the best players in the world. So it's really difficult for young players to break through. At certainly Chelsea, certainly at Man City. Uh, if I if my son was a was a good player um, and Chelsea wanted him or Man City, I, I wouldn't send him there because he's better off going to another club where uh, traditionally they give the younger players more of a chance. More playing time. Well. Playing time. Um, yeah, they can go out on loan. I mean, we've got a, a big squad of players at Everton the last two seasons, and quite a few players have gone out on loan. Uh, become better players whether they play for our first team but ultimately they'll get a career out of football because they've been given the opportunities to to progress at the club yeah so luke that's uh, your question answered anyway um just i think you've already answered the last question but uh, we'll go into um who was your favorite player to play with for ireland and who was your toughest opponent um favorite player for i was paul mcgrath um he was he was he was awesome uh whatever position whether he played centre back, uh, middle of midfield, uh, he just covered the ground. He was like he was always in control. Uh, he was a, a threat in both well in both boxes where defensively headers he clear it, uh, attacking wise he scored some great goals uh, with his head. Uh, and he was just he was just uh, unique because he never trained. If, you know some people say what what was he like in training? Well don't know. I never saw him train. He came over. Uh, it's a bit like Ledley King. Yeah, that's where it was. Yeah. yeah, had his boots. Um, maybe had a, a walk with McBurn and a few stretches and all that. And then what we you know, he'd watch just in the five sides and that. Uh, and then he'd be doing that for the the three days we were together. And then he'd go and play and be the best player on the pitch. He'd go back, um, not train, not train them. What team, whatever team he was at, whether it be Man United, whether it's Villa. Didn't he win play, Player of the Year? Yeah, as well. Villa. Um, Man United. So he he was just he he was. Um, would he have been a better player if he if he didn't have his bad knees and he could train? I don't know because he was he was that good sort of thing. So certainly, uh, without without a doubt, I mean we had some great players, uh, but certainly uh, when Paul was in the team, we were we were a stronger team. Yeah, and he was a standout then for yeah. himself. And uh, I think you always said this was Bagomi, obviously. Um, so yeah, so you you know you look back and you know played against some good players, uh, played with some great players for Everton, um, with Ireland. So I've been fortunate. Yeah. Yeah, well, just in terms of uh, this video, thank you very much for your time, Kevin. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, guys, if you uh, haven't already, please hit that subscribe button. And I uh, just wanted to thank our sponsors, Halfway Cabs. Um, if you haven't checked out their app, please uh, check the link in the description. It's both on Apple and Android. So if you don't mind, uh, hit the link and download it there. So thank you very much for watching Irish Football Fan TV. Have a great day. If you enjoyed this video, hit the subscribe button now. And if you never want to miss a video, click the bell for alerts for all our other social media platforms check out this list below and as always thank you very much for watching really Irish Football Fan TV I think we've got good players there I think it's just